parts of the world do not pay the same taxes that when you hear small businesses. Now, I see a couple small business owners in the room. I'm not going to single anybody out. They're based in Pennsylvania. They pay taxes here. Big companies, big corporations like Walmart that are based in other states use an accounting loophole to avoid paying their fair share of taxes in Pennsylvania. That would bring in a half a billion dollars if we just closed that loophole. These are the kind of things that they don't want, you know, that, that aren't being talked about out loud that often in Harrisburg because people don't want you to hear about it. But you know, the, the comment was made yesterday, and, and whenever we were going over this in our, the, our, the House caucus, it's going to get to the point where in order to understand Tom Corbett's budget, you're going to have to hand out a copy of his campaign finance report as an addendum because it's the only way you're going to understand it. And that's a harsh statement to make, but it's outrageous. When you look at the corporate giveaways and the things that are happening here, and it's being at, the, this budget is being balanced on the backs of kids and parents and normal taxpayers. And that's what you need to be informed about because it, what's happening here is really wrong because it doesn't have to be like this. It's bad, but it's not that bad. Don't be fooled. It doesn't have to be like this. If you want more information about any of these specifics, call my office. We'll be more than happy to provide it to you. And in case you didn't, didn't surmise it from what I just said, there is no way on God's green earth I'm voting yes on this version of the budget when it comes up for a vote in Harrisburg. I will be an absolute no vote. So I'll make that clear. Okay. Can you uh, tell me, I know that in the beginning you talked a little bit about the stimulus money, and that's not no longer going into the state budget. Can you talk a little bit about numbers and what, how much was that, and how much did that mean to our district, and is that really what has caused this? The this overall gap? stimulus money was about two billion dollars a year for each of the past two years. Um, I don't have the exact breakdowns of how much of that went in. I know that um, Tim, how much of that? I know the Governor Rendell did use a portion of it. To fill, and because it was dedicated was for right education, now, transportation, Please. education, and uh, public uh, assistance is where the three big, three big dollar figures were. Uh, I want to think it was about a half, five hundred million dollars in transportation. I think almost five hundred million. In education. It was a lot. Because when you just looking at the numbers, the difference in the revenues received from your district last year kind of equals out to where everybody seemed to have been taking out about a million dollars per district. Uh, so. Well, that, that, that answers my question in that the hole in our budget, that's really where it emanates from. Now, prior, prior to the last two years, the, the stimulus years, was funding, has funding changed since then, or are we... It hasn't changed a lot, but I think everybody's expenses have increased incrementally yeah. that, that have shown, uh, shown that, uh, that increase on the budget cost. Well, and we also, with the costing out study, yeah. you know, that definitely increased some of the money that was being, that was being paid back out. Um, yeah, but of course, the yeah, Paul could probably explain that better than we could. In, terms, Fort Cherry specifically. in yeah. terms of Fort Cherry specifically, um, what should occur under Cold Harmless is we should basically receive what we got the previous year. Right. Uh, the two years prior to the stimulus, we were closer to $6 million from the state in terms of state revenue. The figure given to us this year is closer to the 07 08 number, which is about $5.8 million. Um, the $600,000 loss is basically the stimulus might be used to plug that deficit last year. Mm -hmm. So that's where that's at. I mean, we're clear back to 07, 08 revenue numbers. And obviously, expenses move forward every year, regardless of inflation, cost of living, right. how it goes. Okay, thank you. Um, other questions, comments? Sure. Uh, all the big stuff. Jesse, um, <clears throat> we have two possible places for funding. One, but neither one of them are on the list here. Sure. Help me out with the name for it. But I think everybody in the room here knows it is way up on it. It actually is on the list. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Because let me let me address that one first. The very last thing that what what Paul referenced is something called WAMS, walking around money that everybody always hears about. Um, and basically, it's not literally that we are given money to walk around with. It's different grants um, through the Department of Community and Economic Development that would go to you know, fire departments, um, nonprofits, things like that. I can tell you, I haven't. With the budget crisis we've been in, I haven't had any uh, available to my district for at least two years. It's usually around two hundred million a year falls. What's that? Up there. And that's, it's a substantial amount. Yeah. It is. And what? The, but what the governor? Or what Governor Corbett has proposed to do? If you look on the list of potential revenue sources, if you look at the very last one, 
It's called the Liberty Loan Fund. And what it is, he's, he's taken all these community and economic development programs, lumped them into this big, undefined loan fund. And it's basically a slush fund. Because what he did was, the, the rules are still being written for it. But what they're going to do is, there's a board that's going to determine who gets the money, and it can go to private businesses, it can go anywhere. On that board, the governor will appoint eight of the 15 members directly, which basically means the governor will have direct say as to where that money is supposed to go. Now, if you look at the money we've lost in education, we lost adult basic this year, we lost a lot of really vital programs that people need, I look at that $2 billion and it makes me sick. Because I know, I can guarantee you this, as long as I, I'm the rep for this area, I can't imagine the governor dropping in any of that $2 billion into the Fort Cherry School District. That's, that's robber baronism at its best. So just to clarify, your are how, you said there's none in your district, but how do you go about getting it? Typically what would happen is, and it's different under every governor, but what had happened under Governor Randell is that money was controlled by each caucus, each the House and Senate Democrats and Republicans, each that caucus was each allocated a certain amount of money, and it was basically up to the appropriations chairman, um, which up until this past year was from Philadelphia, and, uh, and it's, I think it's pretty public knowledge. I mean, a lot of it was used for political, you know, hey, we need a, yeah, that's when you ever hear the phrase, buy a vote, you know, we need a, you need a vote, okay, we'll give you a million dollars for something in your district. So that's kind of the caucus to get to your district. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it wasn't as simple as a matter of giving a check. I mean, there was a long pro, you know, it's applications. It's got to be legit. But that's how it used to work. So it hasn't been like that for a while. So give us the name of what it's for again. What, what, it's something community educate. What, what does it stand for? <laughs> the, the money went through the Department of Community and Economic Development. Okay. So my point is community and economic development is sitting out there. It's, it's, no, no, it's not. Well, let's be clear. It's not there. It's, not it's all been lumped into this Liberty Loan Fund. And it's being redefined by Governor Corbett in a way that he's going to be able to direct exactly where that money goes. So. I'm just, I, no, that's okay. Yeah. And it's, it's complicated. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. Well, one of the other things they've identified, maybe this is you're going to go to, I didn't want to steal your thunder on this, but you know, all of us that, and especially those of you who are shop owners, business owners, or whatever, charge sales tax on the things you have to sell to individuals that come in the door. Right now, internet sales, and I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Okay, yeah, they have four, they're saying this could be as high as four to five hundred million dollars uh, per year that's not being collected. They could be collected. I mean, if you pay and you go to, to, to Giant Eagle, uh, or if you go to, to wherever it is, whatever store you're buying at, you know, buy it over a computer, you're not, you're not paying that. And it's actually anti-productive for Pennsylvania business. Right. Sure. Because people will buy it. Because of a competitive, the competitive right. advantage of the business. So my second source of revenue would be the LSA money. Could a school district go and apply? Um, I would say no. one of the, th yeah, the short answer is no, and I'll give you the easy explanation. And I'm not on that board anymore. I, I don't have the ability to make that determination. But in the LSA, we're talking about the, the local $12 million a year that slots the slots money that stays in Washington County for hosting the medals. That's what LSA refers to. Um, the formula that we're in right now, it's about a, it's a one-third, one-third, one-third split. One-third of it is already driven directly out in the communities um, based on population. $25,000 per community plus $10 per resident. That's already been coming into Mount Pleasant, McDonald. You know, it's already coming into those communities as it is. Another third has been going into infrastructure improvements, water and sewer projects to make those affordable. And then the other third is competitive grants for job creation and stuff like that. The one thing I can tell you that the board has been very careful to not do is any negative precedents. And I, if one school came in and got money, then every school is going to come in and get money. In other statutes, Paul, really yeah, the only one yeah. that could apply that under an educational thing would be the Botech system. As a matter of fact, this year they did get money for their new welding program was its job creation. Uh, the opportunity for, for students as well as adults to uh, be trained and educated to, to walk into the workforce. Which then actually lowers the cost of Fort Cherry has to pay the vote that pay for that program. So my, my point is with the LSA money, uh, slots money is, I commend you guys for changing it. I know how difficult it was to open that up again because it opens up a can of worms. 
But I think we're at a crossroads here again, that we might need to look at it again, because when I drive through, not to pick on North Bank, but to look at North Bank, there's a lot of heavy dollars going into Worcester Bain from that casino money, and I know they're the host. Yeah, they're, to, they're not even part of that 12 million, just to be clear. I, I understand that, kind of, but I'm saying as a whole, that, that casino was supposed to reduce our property taxes. And it did. <laughs> it has. Maybe not as much as some of us anticipated, right. but I'm seeing lighted baseball fields in Worcester Bain, and we have places here in this township that can't flush their toilet. So there's a lopsided share of that money going places that I think should be shared equally throughout the community. And if this is a place that we could balance the rural school budgets, the only thing I'm worried about that, Paul, well, there's already been conversation is that these other yeah. counties that receive nothing from having a, a casino in their, in their county boundaries are trying to get that whole bill reopened up that the, the entire remaining dollars get shared statewide. So we, you know, and that's why you don't want to. Yeah. So indirectly, we are. You know, the communities do get some benefit from their local taxes, as well as a small portion of their school taxes. And and, and not only that, Paul. You know, we're the only. Just to be clear. Washington County is the only county in Pennsylvania that has the the really it's kind of the sweetest setup in the state. In terms of, there's nowhere else where gaming dollars directly go back into municipalities to pay for police, parks, fire departments, stuff like that. That doesn't happen anywhere else in Pennsylvania except for Washington County because we fought like crazy to get it set up that way. So yeah, if we open that back up, it would be a disaster. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Good comments. And I'll add that, uh, that a lot of that LSA money goes to the borough and various bars around here. We've invested in various things. Um, so it's tax yeah, it saves a lot of tax dollars. I mean, it's, what makes our budget anywhere near what it is. So, anyone else? Comments, questions? Now's the time. Ideas. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Tina Quattro. I have two questions. Um, the first, just because I don't understand the process, I'd like to have it clarify a little bit. My understanding is that our school budget has to be finalized by the end of June. Um, however, the state budget, we you know where I'm going. The state budget can go on and on. Is there any possibility or has it been discussed that forcing the um, school budgets to be finalized by the end of June could be put off until we have a better idea of where the state budget is going? I had that exact same conversation with the Senate Appropriations Chairman this morning because as, as it is initially, the, the preliminary budget, as Paul said, has to be by, by in May. Okay. And then, you know, we carry it until the end of June. So my, my question to him was, we need to be able to, knowing that we're going to be able to change this budget around because it is so fluid, we're going to be able to fund money back in. We need to be able to get a message out to the school boards across the state what they should really anticipate seeing. Not that the original numbers that the government gave, but some other numbers to help them balance that out. And then whether it's a, whether it's a legislative change, because right now it's a statute that they have to have that budget by that date, although we're not for another month or six weeks later. Uh, but you're right, it would have to be a change, uh, a law change to, to bring them equal to with us, you know, by the end of June or even later so that they know what they're actually going to receive. Uh, but there, I think there's some other things by that Paul may be able to, to share. I don't have anything to do with the, the negotiations, your collective bargaining agreements. No, it doesn't really tie to the okay. negotiations right. collective bargaining agreement. It's always been a statute. For right. school statute district. for June 30th, we have to be. You know. yeah. I would say that I think that that's actually, I think two, for two reasons, I don't think it would really accomplish what you would want it to accomplish. Um, first of all, one thing I've learned in my brief tenure in Harrisburg is nothing gets, nothing gets done until there's pressure to get it done. So if the, for example, if this got pushed 60 days for school districts, that's just another 60 days that this thing's going to drag, this could drag out. It, you know, pressure points are what make things happen there. Whenever every school board in Pennsylvania has to have budgets done, and we're all getting that pressure, Democrat, Republican, it doesn't matter, that pressure is one of the drivers that will make this thing get done. But the other thing is, I don't think this is going to, I, I would be astonished beyond belief if this thing drug out much further than June 30th. For this reason, I touched on it earlier. <coughs> this is the first time in eight years that you're going to have the governor's mansion, the Senate, and the House of Representatives all controlled by one political party. And that's very important for this reason, because whenever, for example, in 09, when this thing went until October, 
it really became a PR battle. Governor Rendell wanted certain things, the Senate Republicans wanted certain things, and what happened from the end of June until October that year was who did a better job of selling why their version was important. And it was in the press and it was all over the place. And unfortunately, it wasn't a good thing because people got hurt in the crossfire. It was a different set of victims that year, but that's, that's what happened. It was a PR battle that drug out over a period of time. That can't happen this year. There's no way. Because the, the Republicans are smart and that they realize that if this thing goes beyond June 30th, they, Ed Rendell's not around anymore. They can't blame him. They can't blame the Senate Democrats. They can't blame the, the House Democrats. We don't have enough votes to gum up anything they want to do. So they own this. The, the, you know, the, the, the Pennsylvania Republicans on down, and I'm not trying to be partisan, but it's just a fact. They own this from top to bottom. And if they don't get it done on time, they'll have no, literally nobody to blame but themselves, and they don't want that politically. So I think for that reason alone, you're going to see this thing done on time. And they're going to want to rub it in Ed Rendell's face that they got a budget done in advance. And if you don't think that kind of stuff doesn't matter, come on up to the Capitol and, and you, you'll be amazed at what you hear. Right, Okay, so so then my next question then to um, Mr. Swoker, the, the school board, is just to take into consideration, and I don't know the answer again, do we have money in a general reserve fund that we could use to tide the school over while we wait for the state to finalize the budget, while we wait until the money from the gas leases start coming in, which which we know are going to start coming in in the next 18 months or so. Is it possible to, to put off these horribly difficult decisions until we know exactly where we're going rather than making rash decisions because we have to do so within the next 30 days? I'll take it. The, the answer is, is uh, no, we, we can't put them off because one for what Representative White was saying, that'll apply pressure down the line. Two is we only have a general fund of 1.7 million. 1.3. 1.3. Yeah. So, so we have basically a checking account of 1.3 million. Our shortfall is more than that. We would burn through that in its entirety in one year, which means you, you could literally have certain times when you couldn't pay your accounts receivable. So, I mean, it's just not possible that you reserve your checking account to get that small in an organization this size. So, th there's no extra money anywhere. We would have to borrow it. Uh, when it was two years ago, we had to jump through some real hoops just to get a line of credit to borrow money that we knew was going to come in in a matter of weeks or months from the state. For money that we can't determine when it's going to come back in, there's no way of borrowing that without having some sort of sort of local bond referendum. So, I mean, it's just by statute and law, it's just not physically or legally possible. Okay, that brings me to my very last thing, I promise. Um, so, so my next my next point is that um, I also have been through the, every single line of this budget, as I'm sure a lot of people have. There are things that can be cut, things that will not affect the teachers, they will not affect the um, the education of the, of the students. Those are the things that should go. And, and in my opinion, what we should do to tie this over is not the one. What are we? 1.6 million short. Um, we don't need that much to keep the teachers and to keep the education of the students. Um, you know, I've heard people toss around things like, um, have we, I don't know if there's grants or opportunities for corporate funding out there. Um, have we or do we have the opportunity to contact um, insurance companies to possibly fund the driver's education program, to um, contact health insurance corporations to fund the, um, the nursing that we're talking about, consolidating and cutting a nurse in each building. Um, I, I agree, there's, there's no doubt, I'm sure, to anyone in this room that we have to cut some things in the budget, cut those things that we need to that are not necessary, um, and keep the, the teachers and the education of the students at the top of this. That's, that's just my point. Okay, excellent. Thanks. One thing I'll, I'll answer to that, and I think that starting on Monday, as soon as this coming Monday, the picture will start to clarify quite a bit. 
And what that's going to because when, the, when there is an actual budget bill introduced, um, as that we've been told it will be on Monday, it will be House bill, whatever the number is, I'm sure we'll get real sick of saying it by the time it's all said and done, but whatever that number is, um, that will show exact, that will give these guys a better idea of what kind of the baseline is. Um, so if the, if in that budget bill that's introduced in the House of Representatives, if they have replaced some education funding by taking from the Department of Public Welfare or other places, I think it would probably save that they could look at that and say, okay, that's kind of a bottom line. The, the bottom line has probably gone up a little bit. And they can start to figure out ways. I think that what you're seeing right now is worst case scenario. And I think it will get better. The, the but I would be amazed if this is the budget that ultimately passed. There's just from what we've heard from our Republican friends in the House, there's just no way they can vote for this. So you are going to start to see very quickly some education funding being put back. It's not going to be enough, and it's not going to be, it's going to be a lot harder than it needs to be. But, you know, we could be back here a week from now saying, okay, we are going to be able to keep this, this, and this. Now let's start talking about these other things. So th hopefully that picture should start to clarify very quickly. Yeah, it's, I think it's clear that there's going to be some cuts, but hopefully it won't be the extent that is on the table right now. I guess that's all yet to be negotiated. So uh, there's going to be a certain wait and see on, on a lot of this. But all good points, and I think it's definitely no draft cut the budget, so any ideas that have been put. Okay. I have another thing. I'd just like to address this. some of the things you mentioned, uh, but I want to mention kind of ties in with what your comment was. And as having gone through the, the budget, just a couple examples. Um, if you go into the object code 58, which is travel and expense, uh, we have a budget of $50,000. Now that's something that, again, when times get tough out in the, in the private sector, first thing you eliminate, no travel expense, therefore we can eliminate a big chunk of that money. Granted, there's going to be some activities that someone's going to have to travel to, but you know, $50,000, that could be cut in half or some nominal amount, one example. Um, uh, another one, you hate to say it, books and periodicals. We, uh, we got a budget of 141000 last this year, 119 is what we're projecting to spend. We got a budget for 141 for finishing out. Granted, no one wants to uh, short our kids any books, but is it something that we could actually defer by a year by saving some money and maybe not spending that entire $141,000 on new books and periodicals? So you take you know, just those two alone, that could be a position or even two positions that we're talking about furloughing. Uh, getting into some other things, uh, general supplies, tuition reimbursement, um, even the one I brought up in the various meetings, we have uh, security, our, our police officer, you know, when you look at the entire code for that function, we're looking at $70,000. I mean, every other school district in this area utilizes the local township. Ferguson uses Smith Township. Chartiers used to use uh, Chartiers Township Police. Is that something that we really definitely have to have here? So, you know, those are the types of things that I'd like for us to see and look at first before we eliminate one teaching position. <coughs> um, we've got independent contractors here that are uh, on staff. You know, again, where I come from, those are the first things to go. And none of that has been addressed in this budget. I really would like to see that being addressed first, again, for the first position furloughed in this district. Uh,
And to, to also to answer that, Paul, I think that if we're talking about in terms of education, because again, let's let's talk about what we're talking about. We're not talking about there's no money. We're talking about the governor has chosen not to make education a priority, and that's just the reality of what we're talking about. If we beat this back this year, and we make enough noise, and basically if everybody between now and the end of June makes, you know, makes it so clear to the governor that this was a horrible, really stupid idea to increase education for inmates at the same time we're lowering education for students, if we send them that message once, hopefully we shouldn't have to send it again. So uh, hopefully it's, you know, well, we're always going to be trying to balance our budget, but you know, will we be having to fight this particular battle again? I, I would hope not if we do our job the first time. So our point is immediate, short-term relief in terms of what I'm getting. But i got to agree with Jamie White on the, the, the infrastructure. You only get that chance to get that reimbursement once every so many years. I, I mean, I think it's a good place to put in because if the place falls down around you in five years and you can't afford that, you now it's the time to do it make a safe environment. Um, but because I don't know, and I'm, I'm just going to say from a short-term relief, what is our transportation look like? Are we filling up our buses on each route? Can we possibly combine the buses just for the one year maybe to get through something? Can we reschedule something? And, and Paul, to answer that question, we are looking at that. I'm sorry? We are looking at that option. Okay. So Mark was looking at all routes. Say where a cut could be made, if possible, to make it more efficient, how you put the word. But he is looking at all scenarios. He's been in my office at least three times with two or three scenarios. We're trying, we want to put 90 kids on the bus. We don't want somebody to drive an hour and 30 minutes. But, you know, there is some realities here. And, and he is trying every bit to be with the bus contractors to try to work. Yeah, I'm not blaming them in particular. I'm just no, saying, I'm just saying we're looking at that, that cost. Change something for one year. We're looking at that cost structure, and we're looking at, again, you have to look at our overall enrollment to draw. That, that's, that's the issue. I mean, it, the enrollment has gone down, so I think it's 246 students. But it's not 246 students in an area. It's spread out. So if you cut a bus around here, how does it impact over there, over here? He is looking, and he's continuing to look at all scenarios on that issue. Paul, another thing on transportation specific to Fort Cherry, is one of the things that we've been working on um, in my office for a while now is working with some of the natural gas companies about conversions of school buses to compressed natural gas. Um, we've actually had some preliminary meetings with that. And Fort Cherry was invited. I don't know if anybody was there from Fort Cherry. <coughs> I heard there was a couple, but we, you know, we, to be honest, we haven't gotten the, uh, and this isn't specific just to Fort Cherry, but we have not gotten the, the interest level that I think we would like to see from a lot of school districts on that. Um, it, with all the natural gas companies being located around here. Um, I know Chesapeake was very interested in working to try to do a pilot program somewhere. Um, as gas now is going to $4 a gallon, and who knows where it's going to stop. I mean, that's an area where, you know, if we, if we can find some funding and something to make that, help make that initial upfront investment, it could really, really lower our cost down the line. I was going to suggest that, but there's two, in our proposal, there's two things. One is the cost that we're going to have to come up with more cost. And then you spend like some time to save money. But the turnaround time, it might be 18 months again before we, we actually. Well, and that, that was all. There's two things. First of all, the, the, you know, some of the industry players were, were interested in, you know, that was part of the conversation. You know, if we find someone that makes sense and it has a high level of interest, you know, in, in, in Fort Cherry, are your buses contracted or do you have a contract? I mean, and that's, but that's one of the problems we run into is that the bus companies are saying, wait a minute, why should we? Make the because it's really the bus companies that are going to be making the expense if we don't even know if we're going to be you know be here in a couple of years. So those are legitimate questions we're working on them with, and we brought in some experts from all over the country and had some very very in depth conversations about how it can be done. And my thought is, if you're the first one to step up and say let's do it, I think more money will flock to you. And I'll also say that one of the things in the house right now, one of the, the proposals we're working on, is incentives uh, for conversion of fleet vehicles. I think that's going to be kind of the future. So I think that, again, it's definitely worth at least taking a, a more serious look at than maybe it was a year ago.